Every muscle contraction you make, every step you make in your mountainous adventures is fueled by ATP. And just like a car running out of petrol, when our muscles are out of ATP, they cease to function. In essence, endurance is all about maintaining this ATP production. <laughs> Endurance training and the role of metabolism. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I was going to take a deep dive into the role of metabolism in endurance. Now, make sure you stay till the end and I'll give you three great resources for research. Now, smash that like button, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell and comment below. Let me know your thoughts and give me some feedback. When training for mountain climbing or taking on endurance challenges in high altitude areas like Nepal, understanding the foundations of performance is paramount. This journey of comprehension begins with the three pillars of performance, a trifecta that holds the key to unlocking athletic potential. Within these three pillars, we find three crucial elements that underpin how well we can endure and perform. But what affects endurance? For shorter mountain activities, such as a trail run that lasts less than two hours, the energy production rate in the muscle cells is king. However, for prolonged events, that stretch beyond the two hour mark, hiking hard uphill all day, is the fuel stores in the body that come to the forefront. The ultimate aim of training for such activities is to magnify the muscle's sustainable metabolic output. It's not just about how hard or how often you train, it's about training smartly with a clear focus on bolstering specific metabolic processes. So ATP or adenosine triphosphate, if we liken endurance to a vehicle, ATP is the fuel that powers this vehicle. It acts as a reservoir of short-term energy for every cell, fueling all cellular life and functions, including those vital muscular contractions that you need during hiking, walking, running, etc. Now its consumption rises with work intensity, hence the challenge faced by many training for treks or high altitude adventures is twofold how to amplify the rate of ATP production, and how to sustain it according to the duration and intensity of the event. But where does ATP come from? The source can be traced back to the food that we consume. Our bodies are masterful machines that don't use food as energy directly. Instead, what they do is break down the food in a sophisticated digestion process, converting it into macronutrients. And those are fats, carbohydrate, protein that you'll all heard of. Subsequently transformed into fatty acids and sugars, which become the primary players in ATP production. This sequence of events is termed as metabolism. It's helpful to visualize metabolism as an industrious ATP recycling facility. It's located in the muscle cells. Here, used ATP is diligently reassembled using energy harvested from our food, preparing the body for the next wave of activities and training sessions. This cycle of consumption, breakdown and reconstruction underscores the importance of diet in endurance training, especially for those seeking peak mountain performance. Performance in these environments demands a unique energy output, but what drives this energy? It all boils down to two primary metabolic pathways that the body uses for ATP production. These pathways are intricate chemical dances that the body has perfected over millennia. They differ in two crucial areas. The ATP yield we get per unit of the food fuel that we consume and the speed of ATP production, which correlates with how much energy our mountain activities demand. Diving into the specifics. Have you ever wondered how the food from your breakfast fuels your day's adventures? What happens is the liver takes the sugars from your meal and converts them into glucose. This glucose can be consumed directly or it's stored as glycogen in the muscles and the liver for future use. This brings us to the first metabolic pathway, anaerobic glycolysis. I want you to think of this as your body's turbocharger. Now this is used during those short, intense sprints or climbs. It's a 10 step process that doesn't even need oxygen and it yields pyruvate and a quick fix of two ATP molecules. It's what's used by the body during high intensity, fast paced activities. Imagine things training regimes like CrossFit or spin classes, HIIT classes, etc. However, in the endurance world, we don't need to meet those high energy demands so quickly. Enter the second pathway, aerobic metabolism. Delve deeper into the muscle cell and you'll discover the marvel of this process inside the mitochondria. It requires oxygen and uses both pyruvate from its anabolic counterpart and fat. 
While it might produce ATP at a lot slower rate compared to anaerobic glycolysis, it compensates by generating a whopping 17 times more ATP. And it's this that makes it so spectacular for our needs for the long, slow slog of mountain activities. At its slower pace, for the well-trained adventurers, this pathway is invaluable for sustained energy during extended sessions out in the hills and high and wild places. Now, the mitochondria, where aerobic metabolism occurs, aren't just incidental structures. They're often dubbed the power packs or the batteries of the cell, and for good reason. A significant player in ATP production, they use oxygen to fuel the process. Now, muscle types further highlight the role of mitochondria. For example, our slow twitch muscle fibers are loaded with mitochondria, making them the champions of aerobic metabolism. They provide the sustained power during long treks, hikes and ultra runs and are notably more resistant to fatigue. In contrast, your fast twitch muscle fibers with their fewer mitochondria rely on the anaerobic pathway for those sudden bursts of power. This deep dive into metabolic processes brings us to a fundamental question. How does metabolism influence endurance, especially in multi-day and high altitude treks? Here's a simple way to understand it. Training for adventures in high places means acknowledging the bond between ATP and endurance. Each muscle contraction, every step in the thinning air drains ATP. As we exert, ATP reserves deplete. Metabolism is our body's diligent recycler, ensuring that ATP gets synthesized time and time again. The more efficiently this happens, the greater the muscle power and the ability to move faster at lower heart rates during your mountain activities. This understanding shapes our training regimes. By focusing on our metabolism's role in endurance, we can target training to sustain high ATP turnover rates. Always remember, our metabolism functions like an ATP recycling plant. It harnesses energy from food, reassembling ADP, that's adenosine diphosphate, and adds a phosphate molecule and turns it to regenerate into ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This continuous recycling is vital. Without it, we'd need vast ATP reserves daily, especially when we're pushing ourselves to the edges of our physical endurance, say on a big 10-12 hour high pass in the mountains. If you know how heavy ATP is, put the answer in the comments below. And if you don't know, look it up. I think you're going to be blown away. Whilst you're there, smash that like button, make sure that you subscribe, hit that bell. Back to ATP. By integrating these insights into your training regime, you'll witness a noticeable transformation in your mountain performance and high altitude adventures. So, to really grasp the essence of endurance, we need to zoom in on the dynamics of ATP. Every muscle contraction you make, every step you make in your mountainous adventures is fueled by ATP. And just like a car running out of petrol, when our muscles are out of ATP, they cease to function. In essence, endurance is all about maintaining this ATP production, primarily through aerobic means. The more proficient you become at recycling that ATP, the longer and the faster you can go. Let's talk about lactate's role in this. Imagine you're preparing for a journey through the mountains. The higher you climb, the steeper it gets, the tougher it gets. Just like that, your muscles have a unique journey of their own, powered by the intricate dynamics of lactate. Now, understanding the significance of metabolism becomes pivotal for every athlete and coach. It acts as the compass that guides your training decisions. The metabolic landscape has two distinct paths. One rapid and explosive, like a sprinter on a 100 meter dash, and the other one steady and enduring. That's akin to the marathon runner pacing themselves across kilometers. The dance between anaerobic and aerobic systems is the essence of energy production in our bodies. Think of it like two engines of a mighty aircraft. Both contribute, but the dominance of one over the other is influenced by several factors, including intensity and genetics. Increase your speed and your body craves more ATP. There comes a point where the steady, reliable aerobic system can't keep up and the powerful anaerobic process takes over. However, it's not just about intensity. Our genetic makeup and training history also play pivotal roles. Someone with a genetic propensity for slow twitch muscles will have a greater endurance edge, levering the aerobic system. An athlete's history, whether it's lots of long duration, low intensity or short high intensity drills can tip the balance between these two metabolic powerhouses. 
A CrossFit athlete is incredibly fit, but because of their training history, they just have to stand up off the sofa and they're already burning glycogen and craving external fuel. But if you take world-class athlete like Kilian Journey, he could run an entire marathon at five minutes per kilometer and stay entirely in his fat burning aerobic system and hardly impinge on his glycogen stores at all. But there's another character in this metabolic drama, pyruvate. Think of pyruvate as a crossroads on a mountain trail where one path offers a clear long view and the other is steep and challenging. When anaerobically active, pyruvate has two fates. One takes it deep into the cell's mitochondria, gifting the body with a treasure trove of ATP, ideal for sustained effort. The alternative sees pyruvate turning into lactic acid. This path, although promising short-term energy, has its drawbacks. A buildup of hydrogen ions disrupts the cell's harmony, bringing with it the familiar burn of muscle fatigue. The route pyruvate takes can be the difference between sustained performance and an early halt. At lower and more relaxed speeds, our body leans heavily on the aerobic route. However, if you up the pace, a shift is observed. If you start pushing your body to its limits, it results in a spike in lactate levels. It's this delicate balance that structures our endurance. And by understanding it, we can prepare ourselves better for the adventures that lie ahead. In our journey to grasp the science of endurance, especially for those training for adventures in high places, understanding the chemistry and biology beneath the surface is pivotal. When you're out there pushing your limits, climbing towards that peak, your body is continuously working and lactate is one of its signs. The presence of lactate in the blood isn't a mere byproduct, but rather a reflection of the rate of which glycolytic metabolism is producing pyruvate. Now, while lactate gives us a biochemical snapshot, our heart rate zones provide a roadmap. Zone one, this is a light jog. This is less than 65% of your maximum heart rate, and this can be used for base building or for recovery running. Zone two, this is where we spend most of our time, up to 75% of your maximum heart rate, and it's used for general aerobic training and base building, and it helps improve your endurance. Zone three, up to 85% of your maximum heart rate. This focuses on improving your aerobic capacity. This is where your tempo is and tempo training and is a sustainable race pace. Zone four, up to 95% of max heart rate. This enhances anaerobic threshold and intense aerobic efforts. And you're getting right into the glycolytic part now. And then zone five, this is just your absolute max out to the wall peak intensity and this enhances maximum power and speed. Aligning these zones with the body's physiological responses promises peak performance, a blend of both biology and strategy. One term you're going to come across is aerobic threshold. This signifies your aerobic capacity. It's known as the onset of blood lactate accumulation and stands out as the exercise intensity where blood lactate rises noticeably above your baseline. Now this can be tested with blood pinprick tests and it can be done in a coaching lab. And these days you can actually buy the blood kits yourself. Speaking of thresholds, the term lactic threshold, synonymous with anaerobic threshold and other labels, denotes a vital metabolic event. It's the tipping point where lactate generation surpasses its elimination, usually about two millimoles of lactate in the blood. Once you push beyond this, fatigue is gonna set in quickly. So let's sum this up and revisit the fundamental principles. One, your athletic speed mirrors the ATP recycling rate in your muscles, which is trainable. Two, both aerobic and anaerobic pathways collaborate to satisfy your energy requirements. Three, high intensity tasks rely heavily on the anaerobic system, though this is tempered by the byproducts like lactate. Four, the heroes of endurance are the slow twitch muscle fibers. These take up pyruvate and use it as fuel throughout the aerobic metabolism system. At the start, I said I'd give you some great resources for further research. So firstly, Training for the New Alpinism by Steve House and Scott Johnson. The second one, Training for the Uphill Athlete, a deep dive into strength and endurance. It's an essential read for peak performance. It's also by Steve House and Scott Johnson. And they also team up with Killian Journey on it as well. And last, Lastly, is Dr. Phil Maffetone's The Big Book of Endurance Training and Racing. It's an encompassing guide that emphasizes a holistic approach. Now, I've put links down to them in the description below. 
Next time, I'm gonna delve into the relevance of VO2 max. Until then, check out some of my other videos. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring that bell. See ya.